Hey, hi everyone. Welcome, welcome to the talk. Welcome to Cube Day Singapore. I hope you all had a great keynote session. Unfortunately, I missed it because presentation jitters. So I'm, I'm very glad that I have my talk at 10.30 today so that I can be relaxed and attend the rest of the sessions. Um, so hi, I'm Anusha. I'm a technical product manager at Nirmata. So as part of my job, Nirmata is a startup. So as part of my job, I do product management. I do a little bit of pre-sales as well. So over the past year, I've been talking to a lot of prospects. And the inspiration for today's talk is based on my various conversation with several prospects. So I, I see two patterns emerging, which is the first part is raising awareness about Kubernetes security, because a lot of people uh, you know, pinpoint on just a single thing and they feel that you know, they are securing their environment, so that is the way to go. And the second part is there are some misconceptions or you know, myths around Kubernetes security or security in general. And also, CNCF provides a wide variety of tools. If you check out the CNCF security landscape, there are about 100 tools, I guess. So what tools to use and you know, when to use them at which different you know, stages of your deployment lifecycle. So those are the some, some of the things we'll touch upon today. But before that, I have a question. So how many of you here have experienced a security incident in production? Wow, OK. And how many of you had to deal it with it yourself? Like debug, RCA, fix it. Amazing, OK. And for those of you who haven't experienced, I hope you don't have to experience anytime soon. But you know, it's going to happen sooner or later. But let's be prepared for it. So Kubernetes is complex to secure and scale. It is complex, no doubt. It is easy only if you have to do a kind create cluster. Everything other than that is very complex. Because there are a lot of things that you have to take care of. Because everything is um, configured as a YAML file. Just to deploy a service in production, you have a deployment file, you have a service file, you have to set up ingress, RBAC, and whatnot. So all of these are configuration files. And these are some of the headlines you may have heard in the recent past. There's about log4j vulnerability, about Kubernetes instances found exposed online, SolarWinds hack. So all of this is not uh, old news. This is maybe in the recent one or two years. So Red Hat has done, uh, you know, security report, they've produced a security report, and these are some of the stats out of that report, like 180% increase in security issues, 93% of them reported a security incident, just like this room, and, you know, misconfigurations are one of the leading cause. Because everything in Kubernetes is YAML, misconfiguration is common if you have to do all of those manually. So automation is the key, and then what tools are we going to use for that? And this is one of my favorite slides when I have to present to my prospects. To, to be able to secure your Kubernetes clusters, you need to understand what is the cost of missing it. So sometimes us as DevOps professionals or you know, SRE or as platform professionals, we understand the importance of it. But how do you convince your management to allow you some time? Because you cannot do this overnight. You have to dedicate time for it to invest in security. And you know, management understand numbers if you want to provide a number or a data-driven approach. So this study was conducted by CNCF. There's a complete detailed study that I've linked, and it's really great. So I'll just explain this first half of this, the top half. So this graph, like, let's forget about Kubernetes for a bit. Any software, if you find any bugs and you fix it when you're coding, that is to the left side of it, the cost of fixing it is just Maybe one developer or two developers, you identify what the issue is, you spend a couple of hours, you fix it, you push it again. The cost of fixing it, let's say, is 1x. As opposed to that, something you have already released into production, you identify there's a bug. Now, just imagine the cost of fixing that. There are multiple people involved. There are SRE teams who have to triage. There are other teams who have to go find out what the issue is. Maybe you get on like multiple calls with different teams and you're spending a lot of time. You're spending a lot of people's time as well. And also your customers may be affected by this. So the loss that you cause by not fixing something that could have been fixed in a coding phase as opposed to finding something in production, it is exponential. It's 640x. Just to put numbers for this, cost per defect pre-production is just $25. But at production level, it is 
around sixteen thousand dollars, and this is per defect, and you can just you know uh, extrapolate it to a cost per cluster, and that is a very big number for me to even read. So I highly recommend for you to read that uh, blog and see how they have they have given a detailed breakup of how each of these costs add up. Um, okay, moving on. Okay, I told you about my conversations with prospects. So the first thing that we do is we want to assess what level of Kubernetes maturity uh, the prospect is on, right? Some are at the very modernization level. Some are already, you know, moved some part of their workload to containers. Some are still on VMs. They're at different stages. So when I ask, what do you do for Kubernetes security or security in general, the most common uh, security measure that teams do today is scanning the images for vulnerabilities. They say that, okay, we are running things like Aqua TV or something else for scanning images, and that's it. But, you know, is it enough? I'm sure, like, if you're not doing anything, just doing this is a good first step. This is definitely necessary, but this is not sufficient. So, don't be under the misconception that if you're just scanning your images for vulnerabilities, you're going to be secure in all aspects of security. This is not enough, but you should definitely be doing this. It's not that, uh, you know, replace this with anything else. And the second most uh, security assumption that I get is, you know, hey, I'm using a managed cloud provider. I must be secure by default. I mean, I'm using AWS, right? Like, come on, it's such a big company. They must be doing something for security. They cannot be giving me insecure clusters. So I'm fine. And AWS is just an example, by the way. Same applies for GKE or AKS or any managed cloud provider. But if you read the you know, uh, cloud provider's security guidelines, there's a very fine print that security is a shared responsibility. So cloud provider clusters, they manage the control plane nodes. They are responsible for upgrading it, patching it, making sure they're secure. But the worker nodes is the customer responsibility. Because, and that is where your actual workloads run. It is your responsibility to secure all of those. Of course, the cloud providers give a very extensive security guidelines on how you should be running your workloads, how you should be configuring your workloads. But doing all of that is not their responsibility. And if something happens, it's on you. Now, the next part is understanding what are the different layers that come in the cloud native security. So this is again uh, taken from the Kubernetes docs where you have code, container, cluster, and uh, the cloud level. So each of these layers, uh, there are different uh, you know, security best practices that you can follow. And there are different teams in any organization that are involved in securing these different layers. Uh, and each of these layers build on the outermost layer. So for example, if you have a contain, if you allow root users in your containers, uh, it doesn't matter how secure your code is, your code is still vulnerable because now you're not securing your containers enough. Similarly, if your cluster has some loopholes, uh, it doesn't matter you know, how much you secure your containers because your outer level is already you know, compromised. Um, so each of these layers build on the next layer. We'll see how different teams are involved in securing each of these layers. So in any uh, development or a deployment workflow, we have develop, deploy, and run phases. In the develop phase, we usually have coding, building, and pushing, say, those images to something like Artifactory. And usually app teams or development teams are responsible for this phase. And in the deploy phase is the DevOps teams who set up different pipelines, IAC pipelines, and so on, and make sure your applications are deployed to the cluster or to the cloud. And then finally, the run phase is where your applications actually run. You need to continuously monitor them. If there are some issues, you need to triage, and so on. So that's where SRE or platform teams comes into picture. So this is not a clear segregation. The lines may be blurred in different organizations, and different teams may have different set of responsibilities. but this is a sort of a, I don't know, template. Uh, and each of these teams should take care to secure their part of the system. And, and you have to secure every part of the system. It is not like you secure the develop phase and your deploy phase is secure by default. No, at every stage you have to secure. At every stage you need to have some set of you know, best practices you need to follow or uh, configure policies and so on. Uh, now that we know the attack surface, 
let's look at what are the different ways different teams can do to achieve some of these uh, security aspects. In the develop phase, uh, the development teams can do container image scanning. So this is you scan your image for CVEs. And you can also do code scanning, by the way, which I've not highlighted here. So here, um, you can scan your code for, say, best practices in terms of don't expose passwords or secrets, or you know, make sure you're using the latest dependencies in your Go mod and so on. And then in the build phase, you can actually sign your container images. And when you're storing something like an artifact tree, you need to still be you know, continuously scanning for vulnerabilities. Because it's not that you scan once for vulnerabilities and you're good. You need to keep scanning them continuously because vulnerabilities can come in any time. And then in the deploy phase, usually the de DevOps team use something like policy-based deployment control. So these policy engines act as admission controllers and they allow you uh, to either block or allow a deployment based on whatever best practices you've configured, based on the policies you've written, you can block or allow certain deployments. And then in the run phase, you still need to do continuous scanning, not that if your deployment was secure at the time of deployment, it's not secure say after two months. So you need to still be scanning for different policies and different security measures. And also, there might be runtime security events. And there are a lot of CNCF tools that are available, which we'll look at next. Uh, yes, OK. So there are different tools. And a disclaimer here, I've just highlighted a few of the tools that I know of and I've used a little bit. But you have to go to the CNCF security tools landscape to see the plethora of tools that are there. So first we have in the, let's start with the develop phase, right? When you're coding. So we have something like Dependabot, SonarCube, and GoSec. Dependabot, as you all may know, it helps you to keep your dependencies up to date. So it will automatically create a GitHub PR for you, and you, all you have to do is review and merge the request. Similarly, SonarCube is again a static code analysis tool, and even GoSec helps you uh, follow all the security best practices in Golang. Uh, and those three tools all can be part of your GitHub CI itself. And then you have uh, something like SigStore and Notary. So SigStore has a tool called Cosign. So you can use that to sign container images. You can sign YAML artifacts. You can sign basically anything and save it and save the signature in the OCI repository. So it is very important to sign and verify your images so that the image integrity is maintained. Uh, and then you have. Once you store these images, build, build these images and store this in an artifactory, something like Harbor uh, allows you to scan your, artifact, your uh, container registry for vulnerabilities. You can use Trivi and Gripe as well for scanning your C, uh, images for CVEs. And then in the deploy phase, you have policy engines like Kiverno and Gatekeeper. Both of these are admission controllers. And they allow you to write policies and rules that help in either blocking or uh, you know, allowing the deployments. And then finally, in the run phase, we have tools like Kubebench and Falco. So Kubebench helps in generating CIS compliance reports and Falco for uh, runtime events. I think it is based on eBPF. I'm not an expert on it. Um, so you can use these tools in runtime to you know, continuously monitor the state of your clusters. So like I said, these are just few of the tools, but there are plenty out there. So lots of things to explore, but you get the idea, right? You need some tools to secure your develop phase, deploy phase, and the run phase. Um, yeah, I want to like close with what we have spoken so far. So we have the commit phase, going back, you know, the coding phase. So here you can identify misconfigurations. Now, applying this to a Kubernetes level, everything is YAML manifest. Even your IAC is YAML these days. Policies are YAML. Everything is YAML. So you can scan for misconfigurations. You can scan for package dependencies. Make sure you're using the latest versions only, because they are assured to be free of any known CVEs. So all of this you, have, you can set up in a say something like a GitHub CI or any of the CI pipelines that you use. And then comes the build phase. This is where you verify, sign, and attest all the images. You can sign the YAML manifest. Um, with cosign, I think you can sign a whole bunch of things. There are different types, like 
heat signing, keyless signing. So depending on what suits your organization, make sure you're also signing your container images in the build phase and not just building and pushing it. Um, then in the deploy phase, you have to validate all the images that you've signed. So it's not enough if you just sign them because at the time of deployment, you have to validate those image signatures. Otherwise, what's the point of signing, right, if you're not validating them? Uh, not just the images, you can now also use uh, admission controllers like Kiverno and Gatekeeper that help in verifying all of the different rules or policies that your organization is interested in and your platform teams have defined those policies for you. Then definitely the run phase, you, you, may, issue, you, may, you may encounter new issues, so you have to continuously keep scanning. This is especially true for uh, finding new CVs because CVs may come in any time. So you need to be scanning continuously to find new CVs. And again, things like Kiverno uh, helps with writing policies to ensure your scan reports are latest. Uh, one of the policies that we usually recommend is, you know, uh, write a policy that says my scan report should not be older than 30 days, because that gives a sense of confidence that my scan report is always active. And then you can also have policies that don't allow images that have severity high or above. Then you can be, uh, you can be rest assured that at least the deployments or the services that are running in your cluster are secure for the time being. Yeah, I think that's all I had. Uh, I covered it pretty quick. We have plenty of time for questions. Yes. Uh huh. I see there are a lot of tools uh, you use from each phase. So how do you manage uh, all these tools and learn about uh, all this? Uh, it, yeah, and also about the license, I wonder, are they uh, free or are they licensed? So uh, like for me, I will see that the, the cost of managing all this can be quite high. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, so like I said, uh, this is again a very subset of tools, right? This is my opinionated view of the tools. There are again plenty more. But even this is a very huge number for any uh, single team to manage this and also to gain ex expertise in each of these tools, how to efficiently use that, that is definitely a challenge. But again, one single team need not manage all of these tools because something like Dependabot and GoSec, your application team uh, may take you know, uh, ownership of it. And then Kiverno or Gatekeeper might be your platform team or your DevOps team. Okay. So that is one way to go about it, to distribute it between amongst different teams. Um, and these are all CNCF tools, so they are open source, they are free to use. Okay. Um, and the way I think some was, uh, I think most of the tools that I've listed here, they usually have a uh, company backing these tools. So there are enterprise versions available if you know if you think. Um, uh, does, does the open source version is not enough or is it, it is too much for you to manage? There are definitely enterprise versions available for most of the tools listed here, I guess. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, so, okay, I'll, we can probably chat later because I, didn't, I don't want this to be a vendor pitch. Um, but uh, Nirmata is uh, mostly for Kiverno. Yeah. The questions? All right. Uh, I just want to take a picture because my marketing person will kill me otherwise. Uh, yes. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I'll be in the hallway and happy to chat with you.